Thank you, Sifar and Vancouver Foundation. I am going to talk about my research. Uh, I'm very excited about my research. And any chance I get to talk about it, I take. So I'm hoping it resonates with you to some degree. It may well not. I'm an economist, so we seem to speak a different language. But I'm going to try and speak the language of uh, everyday life, I hope. So my work's about the origins of human prosociality. And as an economist, I want to start with a quote by another economist, maybe the most famous. And it's from Adam Smith. And Adam Smith is attributed with the idea that it's not by benevolence, it's not by prosociality, that societies work. And economists really seize upon this idea. Economists love it. Now, Adam Smith didn't just say that. He also emphasized the importance of pro-social behavior in humans. And you're going to see that I'm really setting this up as a straw man. I'm going to show you that there's a lot of evidence both for pro-sociality and that there's very good reasons to think that elements of that pro-sociality are, in a way, hardwired into us. My work has been attempting to unearth what the mechanisms are of that hardwiring. So let me get into that a little bit more deeply. Adam Smith emphasized the lack of benevolence in humans in making markets work. Was he wrong? Was he wrong that we actually aren't pro-social? The facts of the science are that he was, if we take him interpreted that way. There is a, a fantastic amount of pro-sociality. I, I imagine that most of you already know that. But in a scientific way, we can prove, and people have worked on, the amount of pro-sociality that humans exhibit relative to other animals. And it may be striking to you to hear that we actually are at an extreme of most species in terms of our prosociality. It sort of depends what your comparison group is, but I'm going to argue that for any sensible comparison group, we're out there. If you compare us to these guys, we're not very prosocial. Does anyone know who they are? Leaf cutter ants. They are fantastically prosocial. They will lay down their lives for their ant colony mates. Uh, they can lift up to 5,000 times their own weight. They're really super beings. And, uh, and they're, in terms of biomass, they're second only to us, I believe, in terms of their distribution across the world. So they're a fantastically successful species that shows a dazzling amount of prosociality. But what's different between them and us? The big thing is that they are all genetically related. They all come from a single, if they live in a colony together, they come from a single mother. And that's a big part of the sort of prosociality we see in the animal world. Human prosociality extends far beyond that. But there are other animals that have a lot of prosociality that don't just limit it to close genetic kin. Here's an example a species that's very closely related to us genetically is chimps. Now, we think of them as kind of loving and decent and incredibly prosocial beings, and they are. But only within their groups. So this is quite disturbing. This is a chimp being killed. And this happens a lot. I'll just move off that. This happens a lot in the chimp world, way more than it does as a rate in the human world. So chimps are really genocidal thugs when it comes to people who are not in their own group. And I know that humans can exhibit that too, but nowhere near the rate that chimps do. Humans have a fantastic amount of prosociality that is geared often towards the completely anonymous other, somebody who have, they have never even met. Chimps meeting chimps from another group that they have not met will often kill them on site if they can. We're quite different. This is a puzzle. The degree of prosociality exhibited by us is a puzzle to scientists. And it's one of the 25 most important outstanding questions in the sciences today, as voted by the editors of the most important journal in science. Here's the quote, and it's really referring to human prosociality. We seem to be getting some way towards understanding its origins, and some of the research I'm going to talk about is about forwarding that and furthering that, um, that knowledge. The theory that I'm going to talk about today is a theory called cultural group selection. It's an evolutionary theory of the origins of human prosociality, and it can be summarized uh, in the following way. We do not have hardwired behaviors, not many of them, instilled into us. What we have is a hardwired capacity to be norm followers. 
So as beings, when we're born, we exhibit a lot of traits that make us look for what's the appropriate thing to do. As children, before we even start to learn that, we show, we exhibit behaviors that are consistent with us looking for the norms that our society will have. The content of the norms, according to this theoretical tradition, wasn't pinned down. And why not? Because we needed flexibility. We needed to sometimes be in environments in which we wouldn't be that pro-social and others where we prosociality would really be stoked up. So flexibility was really valued by our species in our evolutionary past in a way that's not true of other animals. According to this set of theories, the right environment could trigger prosocial norms. And here are some of the names associated with these theories. The academics who have worked on it, they are all evolutionary anthropologists, not economists. Although one of them was a colleague of mine and is what I got interested in, Joe Henrik actually worked in the economics department at UBC and in psychology jointly. Not in anthropology, interestingly. I can talk to you about that after why. So one of the uh, predictions of that sort of theory is something that does line up pretty well in the data. That is that humans are going to vary across societies a lot more on their cultural dimensions, their norm dimensions, than on their genetic dimensions. And if you look at these, these are two graphs of the distribution, the variation in across societies in these two dimensions. The blue dimension is the cultural variation as measured by answers to survey questions. The red dimension is the genetic dimension and it's really tiny. By almost any measure, cultural variation dwarfs genetic variation across societies in human, in human beings. Now, that's a prediction that's consistent with those theories but not a very tight test of them, in a sense that lots of things could explain this. So as scientists, we're not really that interested. It's a nice validation, but it's not proof. One thing about these theories is they do lend themselves to proof in a, in a way that most evolutionary theories don't. These theories tell us what the right environment is that will stoke prosociality, that will build it. And here's what the theories say. They say that if you put humans into a group competitive environment, not an individually competitive one, a group competitive one, that will tend to grow pro-social norms. Okay? Why is that an unusual theory in the, in the set of evolutionary theories about humans? Let me just give you a kind of a brief background on this and why we started being interested in it. Most theories about human, almost anything to do with humans that talk about our evolution in our primordial past point to things in the primordial past that determine the way we are. Now, what's the problem with that in terms of testing? You can't see the primordial past. So what we do is we look at the fossil record, we get little bits of information, but it's very hard to directly test. This theory, because it says our norms are completely changeable but can be triggered by the right environment, says stuff about our primordial past, but it also says things about today. It says where you find group competition, you should find prosociality. It provides a very clear pattern of what we should see. More group competitive environments should induce more prosociality. And this is an interesting prediction why it's very unintuitive. Not many theories would predict this. In fact, most people, when they think about competition, think that it brings out the worst in us. And I played Australian football. It definitely brought out the worst in me and my teammates. The great thing about this is we can test it. So do individuals placed together into more group competitive environments tend to become more pro-social? Myself, Thomas Fujiwara, an ex-student from UBC, and Tongi Van Ippersel from Ex-Marseille tried to test this. And we tested it in a few different contexts. And I'm going to talk to you about what we found. First, had to distinguish what groups we were going to look at. And we thought the most relevant group of collective behavior that pertain to individuals today wasn't tribes, not in the West, it was firms. People who are doing, undertaking a collective task tend to work with other people and it's quite an unusual setting relative to most of our lives. It's the one in which we do most, are most likely to pull together and to be working against other organizations. It's very hard to measure prosociality directly, 
One of the measures that we used is trust. The reason we use this is because it's been asked across the world in many different contexts. Okay. So what did we find? Firstly, we looked at people working in US firms, and we found a striking correlation. And again, something that nobody had seen before because nobody had thought to look at it. If you take the competitiveness of a sector that somebody works in, that's on the horizontal axis, and you compare it to their level of trust, in survey questions, you find a very robust, these are all the points, the points are different sectors, some are bigger than others, but a very robust positive relationship. So lots of things to determine how, how much you trust others, many things. It's correlated with uh, age, it's correlated with gender, it's correlated with race, education, but it's also correlated controlling for all those things with the sector in which you work. This is consistent with those theories of cultural group selection and not much else. Then we did something different. We looked at changes in competition at the level of US states. So this is a very, very hard to identify effect. What we found were in states where competition increased a lot. So we could look at new firm incorporations due to a change in basically the availability of finance. So it was a regulatory change that allowed a lot of firms to enter industries. In those states, and that's the pink line there, in the states where that happens, trust goes up. And it goes up almost hand in hand with the new firm incorporation. So we were shocked to find this. And this is over a period of 40 years in the US. It's a very powerful effect. Then we looked at individuals themselves. So all of these changes, we're looking at a cross-section of individuals. We're looking at comparing one individual to another. Here we take the same individuals and we ask, and this, and this is available for Germans, because Germans have asked this question for a long time and they've tracked individuals in their data sets. We ask, what happens to a German who moves from a less competitive sector, say from, let's start at zero, one that's kind of average in terms of competition, to a more competitive one. So this is the same individual. And these are bins of about 100 individuals in each one. You can see the average effect for one of the, each one of those individuals. What you see is that an individual who changes sector of employment, for whatever reason, ends up having higher levels of trust. And these are five-year interv five intervals. So an individual who in year 1990 moves from a, an uncompetitive sector to an, a competitive one increases their own reported levels of trust. So we see evidence in lots of different spheres. We see individuals who are changing jobs for whatever reason, changing their trust levels. We see across individuals, people who work in different sectors, having more trust if they work in more competitive sectors. And we see at the state level, increases in competition, ramping up levels of trust in the individuals living in a state. So these are all consistent with cultural group selection. That theory would predict it, and again, it's very hard to think of other theories that are going to generate this. We wanted to get at it a little bit more deeply. So what we did is we started running experiments. And for economists, this is relatively new. We actually owe it to psychologists. They really brought it into our discipline, how you should do it. And we used their methods in, in trying to get at why this is happening. Why is this pattern in the data? So we tested it in the lab. We got subjects to play a public goods game. And this is a standard game. Let me just describe it. You put people into a group and you give them a certain amount of money. Say they start with $20 each. And then you say to them, if say it's a group of uh, five people, you can donate some of that money to your group. If you donate it, the researcher, I, will multiply it by more than the amount you put in. So if it's $20, if you gave all of your $20, I will multiply it by an amount four, say. So that will give $80 to your group. So that's a great return for the group. But for you individually, you only get one-fifth of it. You share it all equally. So it creates a tension. A tension between what? What's good for the group is for you to give. That's going to maximize the returns to the group. What's good for you is for everyone else to give, and you give nothing. So these games have been played for a long time. And it turns out people give a bit. But in most games, if they keep playing it, they work out that they do better if they don't give, and it actually tracks downwards. It goes towards zero. So this has been a well-studied game. People start off trying to be, trying to work out what's going on, give a bit, and it tracks down. 
we did one thing that was different. We took that bottom slide, that's the standard game. We just put them in an isolated group. And the other one, we said, hey, you're playing against another group. And your returns are going to depend on how you do relative to that other group. It actually made it more risky to contribute because if, you, if your group contributed less than the other group, you all got nothing. So you were better off keeping your money to yourself. So it made it more risky. What did we find? We observed their contributions and then we asked them if they trust. We tried to see if these groups ended up trusting differently after playing this. What we found is this. The contributions in the group competitive session were way higher. Way higher. So this is, they were starting, if you think of them starting with 100, these guys in the no competition group started around 20 and tracked down. Something that's been seen hundreds of times in these experiments. In the competitive treatments, they started much higher, almost twice as high, and the trend, if anything, is upwards. What happened to trust? Well, here are the two distributions laid over each other, and you can see it's a 10-point scale, but the gray one is the ones in the competitive treatment. The white one is the ones in the non-competitive treatment. And you can see a real shift to the right. More people are responding that they trust after being exposed to this group-level competition. So why did this happen? This is what we think. This is our best interpretation of it. Without competition, people do best if they behave selfishly, and they work that out eventually in this game. They work out that, you know, it, people might be nice, and I'm hoping they're going to be, but people start being selfish, and that tracks down. They start unsure, and they converge to this selfish behavior. And they do, in the end, report very low levels of trust. But with competition, it can be worthwhile for you to pull together and to give. But of course, it needn't always be. It depends on what everyone else is doing. So the norm's not clear. We don't know what the norm is. And people come in, and they're cautious, and they're suspicious, and they start off a little bit higher. If they experience others giving, they give more themselves. And these are the people that we found who report high levels of trust. The ones who experience, so often by chance, just happening to get good, uh, pro-socially motivated people with them, ramp up their own contributions, and they're the ones who report high levels of trust. The people who experience by chance, people who don't give much, reduce their own contributions, and they look a lot like the people in our control treatment. Some groups tend to converge on a norm which involves a lot of giving, and they're the ones who then report much more positive things about trustworthiness in general in the world. So what are the takeaways from this, from our data and our experience? We think this evidence is strongly consistent with a cultural group selection hypothesis and a cultural group selection explanation for human prosociality. Prosociality doesn't seem to be hardwired according to this, although the capacity for it is. Being norm followers does seem to be hardwired. We look for what the norms are and then we want to accord and correspond with them. People can be induced to act pro-socially when they perceive pro-social norms as being the right ones, the ones in their group. So one way of enduring that, and this is where the evolutionary anthropologists emphasize this, is through competition. And groups harness this every day. In our evolutionary past, according to the theorists in this area, that was a big thing. Small groups competing against other small groups for resources. But that needn't be the case today. What is the takeaway that is consistent for today is the building of a pro-social norm is something that some successful groups achieve. And when they do that, they, they further enhance the pro-sociality of people who come in without that norm. And that's really the conclusion of our research. So thank you for, for your uh, patience and listening. And thanks to Rob Boyd, who's one of the evolutionary theorists who provided me some of the materials here. So go. Um, so before we move to the speaker, maybe let's pause for a second. Do, does anyone have uh, either clarifying questions for Patrick um, or, or any, any just observations or, or points of discussion that they want to raise? Yeah. Thank you. I wanted to ask about the measurement of trust. When you're looking at how people perceive trust, is it only within their group or is it within oh. their lives as a whole? That's a great question. Sorry, I should have mentioned that. It's in with, within their lives as a whole. So, and all of these data have asked about the anonymous other. They really try, when they ask the trust question, to get 
the subject to imagine how they would respond to someone who they've never met before and who is in a setting where they have no financial incentive to behave trustworthy. So it's really what we call a weekly institutionalized setting. And we did that with our subjects as well. We're trying to elicit their, their beliefs about somebody who's not in the group, not in the room running the experiment, not us, an anonymous other they haven't met. And that's the thing that, that gets ramped mm. up. It's a great question. Thank you. Yeah, please, what's your name? Kathy. Kathy. Thank you. I was just wondering, when you're, when you're creating these um, pro-social norms, does it, does it matter if example is coming from someone that is connected to my social group or someone that I feel connected to? Is there any correlation? Yeah, that's a good question. So we didn't explore, we weren't able to explore that variation in the data. The reason is when you run experiments like this, you mainly have a body of students. They're mostly the experimental subjects. And we ran it in Paris uh, when I was on, when I was in Marseille, we went up to Paris and ran it. And they have a lab where they have about 800 people that they send messages to. 600 of them are students. So in our room, we had only students and people who are between jobs. So mostly it was students, and they know that the other behavior is coming from students. So and a reasonable conjecture is that we're more likely to follow the norms that come about from the group members that we identify with most closely. So psychologists have actually looked at this. Who do, you, who do young kids look to when they're looking for appropriate behavior? And one of the things they look at is people who are like them in physiological ways, gender and race, those things actually do seem to inform to some degree, but also people who are perceived as successful, are useful, very useful in moving norms and in establishing norms. So there, is, there are biases. Our experiments, we couldn't get at that because we had such a homogeneous subject pool. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, great question, Kathy. Um, Brent, you, did you have something from the web? Okay, so someone's got a question online. Yes, a uh, question from the webcast. Um, do you think that trust is a good proxy for pro-social behavior? Uh, and what are your thoughts on whether there might be different categories of pro-social behavior? Uh, for example, depending on whether the participant has something to gain or uh, give something up to be pro-social. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great question. So uh, trust has been that particular trust question we use because it has been widely studied. And it correlates with lots of things. So people are much less likely to trust if they're risk averse, for instance. Um, so there's, there's other dimensions. But one of the things that really predicts trust is their estimate of how pro-social others are. That has a lot to do with it. So it's not necessarily uh, context specific. But it actually depends a lot on uh, how you perceive others would act in situations where they don't have incentives lined up where they're not selfishly motivated to do something for you, either via a contract or through some sort of punishment. Mm -hmm. And that in, in the laboratory has been found to predict trust behavior, trusting behavior very well. So this is partly a, a survey question that's been validated by laboratory experiments. And that's why we took it. Let's do one more from online and then one more, one more from the room. So the question was, what exactly is the definition of trust? Um, You've kind of explained. Yeah, that. it is. It's it, in our in our uh, measures and the ones we're using from the surveys and the one we used in the lab. It's a survey-based question, but it's been cross-validated by experimental behavior. Okay, great. Was there is there another question from the room? Yeah. Um, when you were talking about sort of uh, an increase in competitiveness, increasing trust, mm -hmm. and how you've sort of observed that in various work environments and, and sectors and firms. Do you think that it is because it's more competitive, people are more trusting, or that more trusting people gravitate towards those situations? Mm. Yeah, that, that's a great question. So you, you, you must be an economist because that's the question we always get from all our economics audience. So this is a question of selection. Do the people who tend to be more trusting choose to go into sec sectors like that? So it's in a cross section, and that's that first bit of evidence I showed you, we have not got any way of controlling for selection. People will just move. They may be all sorting themselves based on competitiveness and it's correlated with trust, but it's not a causal relationship. So that's why it's very important that we validated this in these other settings. And one of the ones, the German setting is fantastic because in the German setting, we have the same individual. And we're observing what happens to them when we take them out of one setting and put them in another one. 
And then we see them trust ramping up when we put them in a more competitive setting, and when we put them in a less competitive setting, their trust falls. So, so that's why we needed to go into that German panel data. And Germany's the only country that's done that. Asked that same question over a long period, 15 years, and measured competitiveness of sectors. So that's why we needed to use German data to do it. But that's exactly why we did it.